to get us started, Katie, would you like to sort of paint the picture of before you chose to do anything, what was the situation, what were the challenges you were facing? Yeah, so I think being a legal department, very paper heavy, manual processes, um, a lot of people not really on board with tech, kind of resistant to that. Um, I think the big theme that was coming up was we need some sort of workflow tool, right? We've got too much paper, people are keeping track of things in notebooks, post-it notes. Um, managers really didn't have visibility into what their teams were doing unless they were asking them, they didn't have a full view. It was hard to tell if we were missing deadlines or things were falling through the cracks if someone called out sick. So we were really in the state where we needed this um, and this was prioritized for the team. I think the other big thing we were struggling with um, and perhaps why people were resistant to technology, we had onboarded some prior software solutions, not specific to workflow, but we found that they were really clunky. And if you had to make kind of small changes, you had to get a tech ask, you had to get budgeting, you had to get that all in. And I think, you know, the legal team in general was just very resistant to that and kind of opposed to moving forward with something that wasn't configurable. So that was another big thing we were really looking for, so that visibility and transparency, and then also the configurability. Great, thanks. And uh, Kasava, how about you? Yeah, I would like to talk about one particular implementation that's very core to our organization, where I represent. Um, being a member of an architecture team, we have to oversee the architecture review process for all the technology uh, being used in state-state workforce, whether it is being onboarded or currently in use or being changed. But this architecture review process is very um, extensive, document heavy, a lot of questions, um, and it could be very overwhelming for the users, especially if they're new, because they don't come every day and submit the ARB request, right? If somebody submits the ARB request and they'll only come back after a year, either for review or submit a new one. So we have to make it a little more easier for them to, um, or drive them through the process, help them make it simpler to submit this um, ARB request. So we have identified that uh, there is a definitely improvement area where we can add technology to improve this experience for the requesters, not only for the requesters, and the SMEs who are involved in, how do they share the feedback with them, and the leads who actually facilitate, coordinate, then how do we actually establish the relation, uh, the notifications after the review, both pre-ARB and post-ARB. So um, that actually was a pretty um, involved operation that we uh, undertook. Around mid-2023, uh, we identified that oh, this process is very critical, is essential for our organization, but how do we make it easier for end users? And that's when we started looking at our process and try to do a deep dive on what we can do to minimize the burden on the requesters and where we can use technology to our fullest possibility. Great. And just for my edification, ARB is Architecture Review Board. Yes, Great. that okay. is correct. So uh, you've identified what you were, you know, what you needed to do better, what you wanted to improve. What, what steps did you take next? Where did you go? So. We, like in mid-2023, we know that uh, there is a process that requires an improvement. And we started conducting a, a rigorous um, process mapping exercise, try to understand where are the pain points, where are the majority of time being spent, both by the requesters, all the involved stakeholders, reviewers, leads, VPs, executive VPs, who has to review this on a periodically. Uh, so we did that process mapping exercise. And then, like obviously, we identified that uh, intake process is what something that needs attention um, significantly. And we started with um, a graph model, basically, wherein like try to understand. Oh, well, there are a lot of questions that we are asking, like 400 questions we ask, but not all of them are relevant for everybody, right? So we started looking at those questions. How do we actually create a pattern? How do we create those graph models and map those questions or a set of questions? to the applicable SMEs or the categories so that we can identify those patterns. But then we soon realized that uh, that's proce that process is good if we can figure it out, but it could take a long time to engage all the SMEs because SMEs are scattered across and they're already busy in their day job. Working, uh, reviewing this ARB process, they could not find time to do this process with us. So then we decided, uh, let's take a look at our last year, we looked at all the ARBs that are um, performed in the last one year and looked at all the questions that our SMEs are asking and try to come up with the patterns. How do we actually, these are the things that SMEs are looking at 
and these are the scenarios that could potentially um, pose this question. So is there anything that we can do to present these questions up front in the intake process so that we don't spend a lot of time answering these questions is either part of the request submission or after submission. And we tried that. And then after doing these exercises, it gave us an indicator that probably we should need a configurable interface that will allow us to not only define those questions um, configurably or dynamically, also give the ownership to the uh, stakeholders. If there is an SME, like an API SME or a cloud or data SME, they know their technology better. They know what is the platform standard. So why don't we allow them to control the uh, questions on how we drive these users to answer this question. So we gave that flexibility. We built a framework that will allow us to dynamically configure the user interfaces. And like we borrowed concepts from the TurboTax or any other, and being the tax season, I can't stop mentioning about the TurboTax. Uh, they are very intuitive, right? They ask you questions which are based on context. So we borrow the same concept and take the user responses like a guided interface where the requesters submit their responses and based on the responses, the system is intelligent enough to present the questions, not only present the questions, add validations, show the rationale why we are asking these questions. Rather because like, otherwise they don't know why they're asking, what they need to answer. What is an acceptable answer? What is the standard? What is deviating the standard? So we were presenting this information up front so that if no, if they, they would know if they are slightly behind the standard or if they are meeting the standard. And that helped us really um, progress with this implementation. So it, it just to, I'm going to summarize that quickly. So you took a look at the existing processes, the existing people who participated in the process, uh, and you also identified as a result of that that configurability was going to be key. Is that fair to say? It is definitely fair to say. Um, because we, like I said, we started with a big bang approach. We are like, oh, let's identify all the process improvement areas and try to find the solution for all the improvement areas. But then I think we needed a framework that actually allow us to solve this problem by its own. Okay. And so how did you get started? Yeah, so I think we took a simpler approach, but not as complex to explain. Um, we got a working group together and really just got everyone's use cases. What did they want? What problem were they trying to solve? Um, and I think we had a lot of bespoke processes. So kind of getting those together and trying to find the big themes. We did do the Appian guarantee. So we had this shorter period. So we really wanted to make sure we addressed that. And what we really focused on was functionality, right? Instead of building specific workflows for one team, we made sure we had the broad functionality and gave people kind of the tools that they would need and that we would really have when Appian left that we could kind of do that. Um, I mentioned configurability. I think State Street had the same, but that was a big piece we were looking at. So we made sure that a lot of the features were configurable. They were exposed on the front end so that what people wanted to be able to change, we did have the ability to do. And where are you in this journey? So you've, you've both identified problems, come up with what you think a, a good solution might look like. You know, today, where are you in, in this life cycle? Yeah, so we're pretty early. We finished up our implementation in October. We got some of our initial groups in, started using, started getting feedback, made some kind of quick tweaks, got the rest of the groups in. I think we're still in that phase. I think we've had some early successes. People are happy. Um, they're adopting the system but there are some additional needs. They want additional use cases. They want to tweak the initial use cases. They want some additional functionality. So I think we're very happy with where we are, but we've got a big path ahead of us to keep moving forward. And the feedback you're getting is from the people you've already deployed and are using it. Correct, yes. Okay. Yep. And how about you, Kasava? Yeah, so like we said, we started in mid-2023 and we took our own time to understand the process. We went soft life in January, not like we only opened it for friends and families, like people who are willing to or like partner with us and provide uh, feedback. And then actual live event in maybe mid of January or February. And we see um, significant improvement in the quality of the intake or information that we are capturing um, during this request uh, process. Because earlier, there is like a 40 page document full of questions and a lot of attachments, a lot of back and forth communication with ARB leads and SMEs had to spend a lot of time answering those inquiries because they're not the same people who are asking the same questions, right? For the leads, it is the same question, but 
uh, people are different. So we, because we added that guided interface, um, there is a significant uptake in uh, the number of requests that we keep getting. And uh, the response has been very positive. Now we understand that we improve the process area where the intake is simpler. Uh, now we are looking at um, the overall process, like how do we actually make this overall process better? How do we manage this communication better? How do we create the SLAs? Where do we add the notification mechanism uh, so that we can hold them accountable for, at a, if there is a task waiting with an SME, but everybody else was uh, done with their tasks, so how do we actually enforce certain SLAs? So there is a lot to be done, um, and there is a lot of interest in getting these things done too. We are looking at the other areas of the ARB. I mean, not only the pre-ARB and post-ARB, but within the ARB, uh, like how do we actually tag it back to the SDLC process? How do we align ourselves to the platform standards and cloud patterns that we are using? So that uh, that information is up upside in front of the user rather than trying to integrate with them. Are, are you able to give us a sense of how many requests are g going through the system on a you know weekly, monthly? Basis? Yeah. So. Between January, February and uh, now, like maybe I, l I looked at uh, that number probably a week ago, there were around 250 ARB requests um, that have been submitted in the system. This ARB request is very time consuming. I mean, I submitted my own ARB request because we, f we eat our own dog food, right? Some, because I'm being an SME, uh, also part of certain implementations, I know how uh, time taking that process is to be. It used to take 15 days, one month, just to submit one ARB request. Now we are talking about like somebody we open that and all the, enable them to submit a request. They are submitting this request in probably three days. So compared to what you what the metrics would have been, let's say a year ago, is this more more volume because it's easier now? Yeah, to it's more requests? volume. Uh, I mean, we don't have a benchmark where like how much time the users are actually spending time because that's not recorded anywhere. So I can't really tell the benchmark or metrics how it is compared to this one. But we do. Based on, like earlier in one quarter, we used to do like 100 and 150 ARB requests. Now we have 250 in less than two months. Okay. So the num and the volume has definitely increased because we made it easier for them to submit. Now the bigger problem is we want we need to make sure that those requests are not funneled in, and we have we don't have a choke point at SMEs because somebody has to review those 250 requests and either approve or make a decision, right? So that's the part where we are focusing now. Okay. And how about you, Katie? Do you have a sense of the scale of you know how, how busy the team is? Yeah, I think we're still kind of phasing it in. So teams are picking selectively what they're putting in, not necessarily putting everything in. We've got a bit more work to get integrated with other teams. So it's a little bit of a siloed. There is a little bit of duplication until we get up to speed. So it's it's not everything in there, right? So it is kind of a phased approach, but we're seeing a fair amount. Okay. And it sounds like you both aimed to identify some early value that you could capture, not boil the ocean, I think was the term one of you used when we were talking about this, mm -hmm. uh, and get something out and into the hands of the teams who would be relying on it so that you could start capturing sort of real-world feedback, real-world usage scenarios. Mm -hmm. uh, I imagine that's forming the basis for the backlog of work that you'll continue to pursue? I, I, I would definitely, yes, because... Um, we do see more uh, collaboration with our stakeholders as we continue to show some improvements every time we meet with them. We show something on the front end. It's a lot easier to gather feedback if you show something and show that some, some working prototype rather than showing going through the documentation and asking the questions because a lot of times they are also busy with their day-to-day -day work and they don't have enough time to work with us and like we can't really afford to have that subject matter expertise, uh, provide that information to them, to us. So it, it did help us doing this rapid prototyping, um, presenting something to the end user every time, uh, stakeholders every time we meet with them. And they started enjoying those conversations. They started providing more feedback and how to make this better. And we started um, venturing into the areas where we haven't thought about it um, by doing this exercise. Okay. I think we'll touch back on that uh, a little later on. Uh, and how would you characterize the, the, the early deployment? It sounds successful. 
Yeah, I think it's been successful, but we've had a lot of feedback, a lot of recurring feedback. But I think, as I mentioned, we wanted to kind of make sure we address the masses, right? We didn't want to over-customize for one team and kind of pull it in a different direction. So I think one of the things we're dealing with now is, right, you know, somebody wants it blue, somebody wants it red, right? you got to make sure that there's kind of a balance. So we're looking to put kind of what we're calling like a power user in place where we'll have like a committee of those. And as feedback comes in, we can kind of vet that, make sure it's it's viable and we want to pursue it and then really putting in like a governance model where we have a team that's vetting all of that and we're kind of controlling what's going in place because we don't want to deviate from what we've built right people are, are pleased with it we want to evolve it in a positive way but not detract from it has the configurability that you sought to build in has has that proven to be as valuable as you anticipated yeah i think so and, and it's a good question because some people kind of judge just for it at the beginning, right? We spent a lot of development time building the configurations, but I think it really has, right? Something as simple as updating a drop down list. Um, but we also have the ability to get full new request types in without going to our tech team, which is proving very valuable. I had one last week where we've got a new team that just has a new use case. We can just knock out their requirements and, you know, within an hour, you can have something new ready for them to kind of push through and start using. So I think we're seeing benefits already and hopefully see a lot more from that in the future. Great. And, and anything to add, Cassava, about configurability? Yeah. So the, the configurability is what actually got us to the point where we are today. Um, because, I mean, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out, like, what, can we come up with a model where that uh, we can address all the concerns and then we got lost in our way because it's now it's very difficult to come up with these models upfront. So having that configurability gave us an option to take what we have and show this, and then give that uh, flexibility to the SMEs and uh, leads. They now they own that responsibility. It's not like somebody like, they don't come to the development team. So all the configurations, all if there is a change in the platform standard, if there is a change in the way that we supposed to, um, there is a blueprint that is updated. Uh, there is a new standard that came in. They don't come to us. They don't have to come to us, the development team. They can actually establish those parameters in the system uh, and define, oh, if they answer this question, we can also do the cross-matching question. If they answer yes to this question, and but answer no to the another question, if they are cross-matched, you ask a different set of questions to make sure that if that is what they are doing. So we were able to add those configurations at the validation level, at the mandatory versus required level, or completion level. Like, when we present this interface to the user, right? A user will know, like, if they have like 300 questions, but not all of them are relevant to them. They know we calculate the percentage how much actually they completed the request. So that keeps showing, like, uh, as soon as you say it is zero percent, but you answer five questions, it says oh two percent you completed. Then as soon as every time you answer the question, there are some new set of questions that pop up. But first times, like, we were able to cut it down to like 40 questions from 400 questions, like for the most simplistic use case. But the complex use cases will probably have more, but that configurability is what enabled us to basically provide that level of customization for our end users. Great. And since you're both busy collecting feedback and empowering users to help sort of guide the future iterations of this, have you also given thought to what kind of metrics or measures you might use to sort of chart and measure success as you continue to build? We do, we do have, that's a, like, that's going to be like a priority item for us in probably this quarter. Um, because now we uh, simplified the process for the intake, right? Now the responsibility is identify those uh, other bottleneck areas where, oh, they submitted it, but we don't want uh, the app teams to wait for two months to get it approved because there are a lot of uh, requests in queue, right? So we wanted to create those SLAs, like, oh, if, if there is a particular um, subject matter area, that is severely lagging, like privacy is taking longer, security is taking longer, governance is taking longer. We wanted to establish those SLAs. And also there is a lot of impediments or issues, like after ARB also, there are uh, follow-up items. Not every ARB is approved, like a, there is no black and white, right? It's always gray area. Oh, we are approving this with a caveat saying that you want to come back and address this in three months. And we wanted to make sure that they are actually coming back in three months and. Um, building the necessary components, right? Those are the SLAs that we wanted to enable. And also to measure our success, how much time people are spending on the request and what is the time that is spent between submission and uh, assignment. There are various stages in our review process, right? Uh, we need to have first um, the request uh, triaged and 
then it's assigned to the lead and the lead will be review it and they do for the triage to the SMEs. We wanted to identify the time spent on each of these uh, individual steps so that we know like uh, where do we add more resources, where, where do we lag on our bandwidth. So that will give us a clear indicators on where we actually can improve the process. Is there something that uh, lagging because we are highly dependent on the uh, people or the process itself is slowing down. So these are the key um, fundamental SLAs that we wanted to look for. Great. And how about you, Katie? Yeah, I think metrics is something we're struggling with now. I think being in legal, right, we're kind of the last step in the process. So we're kind of held to the fire to get it done. So I don't know that process time is like a viable metric for us. Um, but we are debating it with senior management within legal, like what should we track? How do we track adoption? What are those indicators? So it's kind of a hot topic for us. We haven't come to a conclusion there. Okay. I, I, just a personal note, prior to my to this role, uh, I had great sympathy for legal because there were always a small number of people supporting literally the entire organization. Mm -hmm. yeah. And everybody needs everything yesterday. Right. Yeah. right. So I, I feel your pain. Uh, so we've, we've sort of made this sound easy, but I'm curious to know uh, what, what challenges you faced while, while, while undertaking this. And Katie, would you like to start? Sure. I think we had doubters along the way, right? Managers who just kind of weren't on board. They didn't think this would be valuable for their teams. They didn't really want their teams participating. Um, I think interesting, we talked about this, but they're kind of, they wound up being the first adopters, right? They kind of did that 180 and they're kind of the people championing it the most. Um, uh, John mentioned the boil the ocean, but I think we had a lot of people like that that were saying, you know, we want everything. If it's not perfect, it has to have all these bells and whistles. As I mentioned, that was a little difficult because we did want to solve for the masses. We didn't want everything to be perfect and fully baked. We kind of wanted to design that. And I think that ties to our last problem, right? I think what we found is it's very hard for people to articulate what they want. Right, everyone has a problem and they have a need. And when you sit down and you ask them what their need really is, maybe they don't have one anymore or it's not what they thought it was. Um, and I think that kind of worked out well for us because we kind of did this kind of half entry, if you will, where we can kind of reassess and say, okay, get in there and explore it a little and then see what your needs are. And then if they've changed a little, we're not so far in that we kind of can't pivot. Um, so that one kind of worked out well. Yeah, and honestly, there's a lot from a career in software development. A lot of those challenges exist, mm -hmm. including the ones about the doubters. You know, I, I've heard them called corporate antibodies who roam around and squash any new idea. Yeah. Right. Uh, turning doubters into believers, though, the way to do that is to deliver something that works. Right. Yeah. How about you, Kasava? Yeah, so I share the same concerns uh, that uh, Katie has mentioned. Uh, uh, it can resonate pretty much for, for everybody. Our challenges are not very different, but uh, I would add that. Most of our stakeholders are also technology, like they are very tech savvy, right? So as a technology enthusiast, right, sometimes we do have that urge to make this make things near perfect or if not perfect, right? So oh, why can't we do this? Why can't we do this? And then we get into that rabbit hole and we'll never come back. Um, so we did uh, experience those issues, like try to build a perfect user interface, try to build a perfect user experience, or try to uh, find the solutions for every problem area that we have identified. And uh, we soon realized that we're spending a lot of time trying to come up with the perfect uh, uh, scenario. So then we took, uh, we took a step back and say, okay, let's try to build the MVP, most viable product for everybody that works for everybody, delivers the functionality, adds the value, then come back because the user experience is subject to a lot of times. Something that uh, you like, probably other person may not like. So we try to gather that feedback from multiple uh, stakeholders and try to add that um, uh, the user experience uh, features in the subsequent releases. Great, and uh, I'm I'm curious. So you know, let's talk next steps. So you're clearly not not finished. More work to do. Uh, what's next? And most interestingly, you know, are there specific technologies or advancements in the state of the you know of the Appian universe that you think will be particularly helpful going forward? Yeah. So as you can imagine, this architecture review process is very tech centric and. Uh, has the tendency to um, work with a lot of internal processes or integrate with a lot of other systems, right? Uh, because this is core of the technology that is being procured or managed in state state. So it has integrations with our SDLC processes, our platform standards, our change management, because I mean, that has to, whatever the buck started, right? We have to make sure that um, it flows through uh, in the process. Uh, 
and um, so we do envision a lot of um, integration with um, the, the systems that we have internally maybe hr system because if you want to send the reminder not only to the people but people who they report to so we need to integrate with these hr systems as well and um, key priority item for us to do is basically the no enabling the notifications and creating that visibility across the product and the platform that we are using Great. How about you, Katie? Yeah, I think we have a lot. We want to look into DocuSign integrations. We have a contract lifecycle management system. We want to integrate with Appian. Um, we want like to start exploring templates, right? Do we have any basic agreements that we can kind of push to like a straight through processing? Um, we are interested in the AI possibilities potentially, right? Is there a way we can use assignments, right? Looking at the content and kind of directing that. Um, a lot of reporting needs, right? People are putting data in, they, they got to get that data back, particularly for regulators and such. Um, and then I think the big piece, as you mentioned, integrations, right? We've got a couple different instances of Appian across the firm. How do we integrate those together, get more teams involved and kind of start bridging those gaps so that it's a fully integrated process? That's interesting. I, 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 I'm tempted because it's 2024 to dwell on the AI part of this. So I, I will just ask, did you guys see the keynote this morning where they flashed a ton of new AI skills? Mm -hmm. It struck me that some of those feel like they might apply, uh, particularly in terms of how to create and manage and understand and distribute content. Yeah. Seemed like that might be appropriate for, for some of these use cases. Yeah, it does. Um, yeah, so we do see a lot of uh, possibilities uh, where we can, we can use AI to um, innovate and improve our process. But as you can imagine, being in the financial industry, which is highly regulated, we are carefully evaluating our options, um, how, where to use AI, where, where to be cautious. Being the technology enthusiast, right, I can't stop, but uh, I can't help but remembering, uh, like, we can, we do, I can see that there are possibilities, like, we capture a lot of information as part of the intake, and that information is scattered across multiple documents and multiple questions. We can use AI to aggregate this data and create a summarized uh, targeted um, text for the SME so that it will make it easier for them to make decisions and create those flags and tag them appropriately. Uh, we can use AI to score our request basically, oh, based on these parameters, based on the an answers for these questions, our risk score is this. Uh, we can score it based on the risk and compliance, governance, security. So there is a lot that we can accomplish, but we are not trying to jump ahead of the gun try to evaluate, the, because there are a lot of other challenges that we would like to address first. A is definitely something that we are looking at, but we are very careful in adopting those AI technologies. I, I like the quote that um, Matt mentioned right today. You want AI to drive your car, but you, you want to keep your hands on steering yeah. all the time. So you don't trust your uh, AI to drive the car. So, and architecture review process is very critical. So we use AI where it can actually uh, enable us to make some decisions faster but uh, we don't want to drive the AI so much that uh, it'll eliminate the human need. Sure. How about you, Katie? Yeah, I think ours mostly comes down to the documents, right? We're getting a whole slew of documents, whether it's a new rule or an IMA, an agreement type thing. Um, and I, I agree, I think we still need to be involved and there's regulatory concerns, but if we can kind of use it like a lever to help us get ahead or kind of scan a document to help disseminate those reach outs, we may come down to it in a day or two later and change what we've done, but at least it's kind of out and we've cut some time there. Um, as I mentioned, we do, we're always under the gun and just we've got a lot of documents to get in a short period of time. So anything we can do to kind of help get it out there and be smarter, I, I think we're willing to explore. Sure. And we have three minutes before we want to take some questions. So we'll ask the final, final question. What advice do you have for the audience? Yeah, so I would say, right, what was successful for us is really trying to solve for the masses, I call it, like that 80% or 85%. Don't try to solve every issue. Um, I think one of the ways we really tried to keep that under wraps is like watching scope creep and really limiting the customizations. Um, we can get to those other pieces when we get to them, but they kind of detract at the beginning. Um, and the other thing I think we found super valuable and has made us successful, I mentioned I have no tech background, I am a paralegal. Um, 
our finding is it's really, really helpful to have the business in there, right? To have this application be owned and driven by the business. We weren't playing the game of telephone of kind of passing our requirements to a tech person and maybe got lost in translation and then it's coming back. Um, we were really in there and driving it and leading the requirements. And I think that's something we found really to make this successful and we plan to maybe start replicating with some other things as well. That's great, thank you. Kasama. Yeah, so I can't agree more with uh, Katie. Like big bang approach probably, it really works. So try to focus more on the process areas or the improvement areas where you get the significant gains, like where it, you can add more value and address them first and uh, or also find the areas where you get more feedback uh, once you start implementing that. So we tried doing the same thing, uh, identify the key areas, key improvement areas where we get the maximum benefit and um, that allowed us to go live faster and do an iterative improvement. Uh, one more thing that also worked well for us is, I mean, we used rapid prototype, rapid prototyping to our advantage. I mean, I all encourage everybody to do that, especially when you're having conversation with the stakeholders. Use rapid prototyping to your advantage to build something it doesn't have to be for fit show the concept rather than showing the document, show something that you actually built and that will help the quality of the conversation that you have with your stakeholders. Great. Thank you both. And I want to thank you both for a great, great discussion today. We have a microphone wandering around. If anyone has questions they'd like to ask our panel. If not, you'll have six more minutes for coffee. Something you described in the, the solution that you built was the, you spent a lot of time deciding what customizations you wanted to have available. So, so to me, I, so Appian had this capability a couple years ago where we built something where the development team surfaced the logic into the app and allowed the business user to make changes. And it sounds like what you were saying that yes, you did. Yes, exactly. And I'm intrigued to know like how, how far did you push that? Did you, did you, are these like, you can change a drop down. That's kind of cool. Did you go further into like things that actually might change the application somewhat dramatically? Did, or how did, how did that work for you? Yeah, so what they built for us, and it was kind of like a hierarchy structure, but we can add new tasks, so any of the repeatable tasks can be pre-configured. Um, we can then build them into a task block, so you can have kind of a group of tasks. And then the third layer was a new request type. So then you can build a new request type, assign it a team, kind of all your initial parameters there, and then kind of stack the task blocks or a task onto that, um, which was pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool. And it, and it may sound simple to some, but I think looking at what people wanted, it really addressed our need and, it, and it's really helping us get new use cases out there. I think the, the only piece you have to kind of deal with is getting the like access group on your tech side, right? You get that set up and then you kind of can connect it into Appian and you're good to go. I'm gonna build off that question. Was that done in production or development? So it is done in production. I will say not being a tech person, I do also have to do it in stage and then clone it in production. But we've gotten comfortable that it's not done in development. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. Do you have a process to reverse replicate those changes from prod to the dev environment on a, on a time basis? Make sure the environment- I think we're safe. looking at that. I don't think we do at this point. Anyone else? Oh, there we go. Thanks. Um, wondering, were you able to create any no touch or straight through processes um, by developing with Appian? Scrape through process, like email scraping that you're talking about? No, or I, I, scraping? I think she means straight through, like no human touch. Yeah. Oh, no human touch, okay. I, I think, if I could maybe feel this, I think for both of these use cases, it would be very, very challenging because both of them rely on a lot of human capability. Both the all the SMEs and the architecture review process, that's people making judgments. Mm -hmm. One day, maybe we're there with, a, with AI. I don't know that anyone's comfortable quite yet. And I think that the whole notion of teams of people involved with legal uh, are still very much reliant on human intelligence. Right. Yeah. I would say the one thing we're hoping to explore when I mentioned the templates would be that, right? If you could have an intake form that kind of 
pre-populates what would be your blanks in a legal agreement, that that could push through, but we're not there yet. Yeah, we do have some opportunities to do that um, strike through processes like, um, I mean, you have conducted a ERB review process now, but your platform standards change over the period, they evolve, right? And there has to be a retrospection that needs to happen, not necessarily the requester has to come and do that, right? There is a process, like a back, completely a background process where we can use to do those additional validations and flag them appropriately, that if there is something, certainly certain, something that is out of norm, right? And you also have a strike through process wherein you need to notify or notification mechanism could be completely unattended, right? Where you don't need a human intervention, except, except for the exceptions. Right. Having said that, there are absolutely Appian use cases that are straight through. Uh, I just don't know that these are two great examples of those. Anybody else? Yeah, I had a quick question. My background's all OTC derivatives and custodial banking. And I love the legal use case and data, but have you actually thought about positioning this within your companies for back and middle office automation and actual support around your investment book of record, collateral management, things of that nature? Because it seems to me that could there could be a lot of value there too. I didn't, I didn't quite get the question. So I, I, I think the question is, have you thought about positioning Appian as playing a role in the operational middle office kind of space, which uh, I'll say before I let you answer, uh, Appian actually plays for a number of organizations a fairly significant role in the middle and back office. Uh, so not territory we're unfamiliar with at all. In fact, I want to say State Street likely does a fair amount of that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I mean, we do have multiple systems and yes, certainly Appian has a role to play in streamlining the back, like a middle office back office uh, processes and we, they are being used. We used it for client onboarding. I mean, we have a variety of tools, especially me from workflow and automation uh, tools background. And that's what I oversee in Straight Street. I do see uh, where Appian actually plays a role in client onboarding, um, performance analytics, um, or custodian business. Uh, same with other tools as well, but every tool seems to have its own place depending on what it does. Appian is very good at like having a process, not only like a background process, but when there is an exception, a clear way of uh, what you call orchestration and a pretty near, a decent user interface. Yes, but not for everything. Great. We have 15 seconds left. Are there any other questions? I think we can run, I think we can run a minute long. I don't mind. Uh, you both spoke a lot about um, changes to your internal change management process and how you're taking in requirements and, and all at a very like internal level. Uh, our Appian instance and our firm is actually heavily integrated with State Street actually. So I'm curious how you bring in you know partners or other Appian instances of other firms that you connect with and how you go about you know the requirement gathering process, the release process, and really finding the right balance of when the right time to incorporate you know partners would be. Um. To be honest, uh, I don't engage in those discussions because uh, part of my role is to oversee the adoption, but I don't get to say when to bring the partners. Sometimes there are projects wherein the business is a little more knowledgeable um, and they engage the partners a little early, but sometimes they come to us. We work with those uh, business stakeholders and then identify what to be done. We do a feasibility study preliminary analysis and then find out like, sometimes they come with, oh, I want to build this in Appian. Probably not, Appian is not a right tool to build those one. Like if somebody wants to build um, a very complex reporting engine, maybe you say, okay, you find something else. So we don't get carried away by um, what business comes to us. So we partner with our business teams, identify what their needs are, try to come up with a prototype, uh, then get into the business of identifying the stakeholder, like a partners who can actually implement this for us. Yeah, and I'd say we're starting slow, right? We're kind of early. I know we've got teams looking at the onboarding. We're looking at the legal because we're very closely partnered there. I think the plan is to get us to integrate, and then we can kind of build that concentric circle. We're just not there yet. Was there another question on this side? I'm definitely interested in the uh, the two areas that we have presenting here. Um, I was wondering if there were any quick, like uh, low-hanging fruit or 
easy win examples of something that you've done with uh, with Appian in those areas. Uh, my area is kind of healthcare, but we obviously have finance and, and legal within all of that. So, from either or both of you. Uh, I mean, to be honest, the platform itself is like um, allows you to have those low hanging fruits and address those low hanging fruits and uh, attain those quick wins, right? Like build something really quick. Like some, if they have like a 20 questions that they are answering, you can build a quick form and say, is this what you really want to do? And then get, gather their feedback and create a process behind the scenes to manage it for them. Create an approval process, create an auditing process, documentation, all in one platform, right? Uh, rather than like if you go with the traditional development model, you have to build a front end, then you have to build a middleware, you have to build the back end, then find some way to host all this information. The quickest one is build something faster, get, gather the feedback faster, and um, innovate on the iteration. Yeah, I, I would say f f forms and surveys and sort of routing and managing that, very, very easy to do. You're talking, you know, hours at most of work in Appian, and a lot of business problems start with that. There's a form somebody's filling out, and you got to get it to the right people. So that's an interesting, low-hanging fruit way to start. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. Anybody else? Great. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you to a great panel. Thank you. Thank you.